The conflict could end tomorrow if the international community wanted it to end. But it is being kept alive the same way all unjust wars are sold to us, by a narrative that replaces the truth. In this case, to the point of turning reality virtually upside down. If we poke our heads outside this bubble, suddenly we see that the conflict is not complicated. Indeed, we see that it is not a conflict in the proper sense at all. What is it? It's an ethnic nationalist settler movement, Zionism, that seeks to enforce an ethnically pure state on other people's land. The people resist. That's the conflict. But the word conflict is necessary. Why? It's necessary for the illusion of two sides negotiating and of a peace process. But this is delusional. There is no negotiating when one side holds all the power, all the weapons, all the clout, all the perks of statehood, is blindly supported by the most powerful nations, and to top it off, when that side actually benefits from there not being any resolution. <coughs> Although the Palestinians are the obvious victims of Zionism, hidden by Israel's creation myth, by the Zionist narrative, is Zionism's parallel violence against Jews. Like its violence against the Palestinians, Zionism's anti-Jewish violence took two forms, physical violence and dehumanization, that is, racism. For both peoples, the physical violence was to force mass human migration, just as Palestinians could not be removed from their land except by violence against them, Zionism could not install a critical mass of Jews in their place without violence against Jews. For the Palestinians, this was outright ethnic cleansing and massacres, as well as starving them off the land by expropriating all means of livelihood. For Jews, Zionist violence was more camouflaged. Its principal forms were the blocking of any safe haven outside of Palestine, manufactured violence to force the uprooting of Jews living elsewhere in peace, and the indoctrination of Jewish DPs, displaced people, and children into Zionist messianic fundamentalism. But all this, obviously, is violence against civilians to force a political goal, i.e. terrorism. <coughs> that is to say, the Zionist project itself is by its very nature one of terrorism. There's no way around this. The only way you can force a population from its own land and replace it with a different population is by massive violence against civilians. Well, this is no good. Nobody's going to admit that what they're doing is terrorism. And it is as an antidote to this problem that Israel dehumanized both the Palestinians and Jews. One, it needed to spin its terrorism against the Palestinians, the obstacle to its settler state, as the opposite, as defense. To do this, it dehumanized the Palestinians into an eternal threat, irredeemably violent as a race. Secondly, Israel needed extraordinary impunity. It needed to be able to operate outside the norms of civilized nations. And it is to achieve this that it dehumanized Jews, the means to its settler state. It achieved near total impunity by dehumanizing Jews into the settler state itself. I submit that this, reducing Jews as a people into this ethnic nationalist political invention, is the core of the entire tragic history. If I am correct, shining daylight on this is the conflict's Achilles heel. Israel is constantly reminding us that it is the Jewish state, not a Jewish state in the sense of a national faith that any nation might adopt. Rather, Israel's claim is something altogether different, something unique in the modern world. It acts as the very embodiment of Jews themselves, all Jews in a tribal sense, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their own perceived self-identity. It expropriates Jewish history, culture, and persecution, and all they symbolize back to the Jewish kingdoms cited in the Old Testament, of which it claims to be the rebirth in order to support the narrative that it is not a settler state. And it reinforces this by expropriating relevant archaeological artifacts as artifacts not just of an ancient Levantine people, but of the modern nation-state's history. We are to accept that the nation-state seated at the UN is that biblical kingdom, but 
2,000 years ago, for reasons beyond its control, the pause button was pushed. And finally, in 1948, Prophet Ben-Gurion pressed play, and Israel resumed from where it left off. This messianic facade has enabled Zionism to sell itself in an allegedly post-colonial, post-conquest world. Every time that Israel refers to itself as the Jewish state, remind yourselves that it keeps millions of people in internment camps, more politely called refugee camps, in order to do so. Israel presents itself as interchangeable, interchangeable with Jews as a people. And the military advantage of this abuse is staggering, reducing Jewry itself to a human shield to empower the state's crimes. Condemnation of the state becomes condemnation of Jews, all Jews, simply because they are Jews, thus <coughs> making condemnation of Zionism and Israel anti-Semitic by definition. But if we accept this, if we accept that Jews as a people equal Israel, then Jews are committing the nation state's crimes. Israel cannot have it both ways. Thus, Zionism, if we accept it, if we accept it, succeeds where all the bigots through the centuries never could. Traditional anti-Semitism can only attack externally. Despite all its murder, all its horrors, all its desecration, traditional anti-Semitism is powerless to lessen the integrity of Jews or Judaism. Zionism, if we accept it, does. If we accept Zionism, if we accept Israel at its word, then we have corrupted Jewry itself from within. And so the oft-heard question, does anti-Zionism necessarily equal anti-Semitism, is backwards. The question should be, is Zionism necessarily anti-Semitic? It is to assert this implicit ownership over all Jewry regardless of their nationality, regardless of their own self-determination, that Israel refuses to allow Israeli nationality. By Israeli law, the nationality of Jewish citizens of Israel is Jewish. Any acknowledgment that a Jewish individual might be free of an intrinsic connection to Israel would undermine its messianic pretense as the obligatory common destiny of Jews because they are Jews. Nationalism and what Zionist leaders would refer to as the Jewish race or tribe were made one and the same in the service of the settler state. It is consummate irony then that Zionism is now being flaunted as Jewish self-determination. We hear this all the time now. Zionism is Jewish self-determination, therefore to be against it is to be anti-Semitic. No, it is exactly the opposite. It is the hijacking, the hijacking of Jewish individual self-determination and self-identity. But, okay, here we are seven decades after the 1948 war and a century after Balfour. What happens next? How finally do we fix this? Increasingly, it is clear that the only possible solution is what should have happened in 1948, a single democratic, secular state of equals. The good news is that, thanks to Israel, we're halfway there. <laughs> Israel, in its quest to finish its unfinished business of 1948, has not only discarded partition, which it did 70 years ago, but has also discarded the 1949 armistice line, essentially the so-called 67 borders, and made a single state. The two-state solution, if ever it was a good idea, and I don't think it was, was dead by 1949. But thanks to Israeli aggression, we have in reality a single state encompassing Israel, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights. A single state divided into various ghettos of apartheid and prison. Once we acknowledge that it is already a single state, who could possibly object to making everyone in it equal. What could possibly be the objection to that? <laughs> Earlier, I said that the conflict could end tomorrow if our own governments wanted it to end. And lest this claim still seem exaggerated, I ask you to imagine for a moment how the United States and the international community 
would react if the situation were exactly as it is, except that the ethnicities were reversed. If the ethnicities were reversed, the international community would rush their military to the region to stop what it now empowers and finances. It would suddenly demand an immediate end to race laws and the creation of a secular state. And the international community would jump to proclaim that equality obviously, obviously means the unqualified right of return. It would suddenly be self-evident that you can't ethnically cleanse people and then say that equality doesn't apply to them because they're not here. That would be a grotesque parody. And it has been a grotesque parody for 70 years. So what's the problem? Exposing the truth of the conflict should be a simple matter of the emperor's new clothes. Well, the problem is Zionism's kidnapping of Jewish identity as a military weapon. Every time the child points out that the emperor is naked, he or she is branded an anti-Semite and silenced. This Israeli military tactic of using Jews as a human shield for impunity needs to be called out for what it is, especially when it is institutionalized. For example, with the US State Department definition of anti-Semitism, uh, according to which pretty much everything I've said tonight is anti-Semitic, <laughs> And the definition Israel is pushing in Europe, both among governments and churches, the so-called IHRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, which by its very name exploits the memories of the Nazis' victims in order to empower new ethnic racial crimes. What greater betrayal of their memories? We must do what Edwin Montague a Jewish member of the British government, did a century ago. We must accuse our governments of anti-Semitism for colluding with the Zionists. 